That's weird. There's an X and it keeps on changing colors. Yes. Why does it change colors? Well, we, we haven't investigated polarized light yet, have we, Lila? No. no. Well, just to sort of simplify, back there is a very bright projector and they're shining a light up here. But in front of the projector, I have a special kind of plastic that makes, that cuts out all the light except going in one plane. And of course, because the plastic is turning, that plane is constantly turning. Then behind this screen, I have another one of those pieces of plastic. When the two of them are exactly at right angles, that's when it gets dark, like that. And when the two of them are lined colors. up, then it gets light. But in between those two things, I am putting plain cellophane tape. And it has the characteristics of twisting that light just a little bit to produce a color. Oh. Watch, I'll put another one right over the middle, and you watch what happens to the center. Change to a completely different color. Yes. Now scientists use this principle of polarizing light to study all kinds of things, but especially crystals. And notice that when you understand that this particular uh, thing is changing color with from blue to yellow, right, or gold, yeah. in a certain position, you now know when you look at this that there must be more layers because it changes color right in there. Yeah, so if it's three layers, it's Three yellow. layers is one color, and if it's yeah. four layers, it's another color, and so forth. In fact, you go back, take a couple pieces of the tape, and put it on the screen, and see what kind of an effect you can create. Don't cross it in the middle this time. Put it someplace else. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, now take another one at sort of an angle. Okay, now come around and see what you've done. Now everything's now, well, now we have a, Now we have a red and a blue up here. See, here's two layers right here. Also, it depends on what angle you cross them. So you're getting all kinds of different effects. That's neat. Now, scientists don't necessarily do this for spinning. They do it to study, you know, the surfaces and the layers of crystals. But it's sort of fun to be able to play with it and make modern works of art. In fact, I have one all prepared. Do you? If, yes. If you wait there for just a minute, I will bring it up and you will see what you can do when you do layer after layer after layer. Oh, that's beautiful. Isn't that pretty? There's tons of colors. And lots of different colors and lots of different shapes. And it's always changing. And all of this is done with that plain transparent cellophane tape, putting them between two polarizers to get what looks like thousands of different colors. Jason, do you have a wading pool like this? Yeah, my little sister has one. Okay, well, they're a great lake in which to launch a jet-powered boat, which this bottle is. That's a boat? Yeah, it looks like a plastic bottle, which it really is, but you can make it into a jet-powered boat by, first of all, putting waterproof tape and putting two nails at the bottom. They're the ballast. And later on, see if you can figure out what that thing is. Okay. Back here at the back end is a tiny hole now, here is the kind of tablets that you put into water and they fizz. You break oh. them up and put them in the boat because that's going to be our fuel. Okay. When you put water on those tablets, they give off carbon dioxide gas and we're going to have the bottle full of water so there's going to be pressure inside. If I put the top on, where's the pressure going to go? Oh, okay. So it's going to come out the little hole at the back. Right. And as the gas and water come out the back, what happens to the boat? It goes forward. All right. So all you have to do is now is add water. It's fizzing. Put the top on and launch it. There it goes. Oh, I see what that little piece of tape is for now. It's kind of like a rudder to steer it. Yes. That's really going yeah. fast. So that's how to, you can take headache uh, tablets, put them in water, and make a jet-propelled boat.
mouse on the left is a lot heavier than the mouse on the right. That's because it's been bred that way. Forty generations of inbreeding have produced a strain of mice that are from 50 to 100 percent heavier than normal mice. Scientists at Colorado State University have bred the mice for nutrition experiments to determine the effects of heredity and diet. Both the fat mice and a comparison group of normal mice are fed special diets. The results could be applied to people who are overweight or to beef cattle to help fatten them for market. Possible results of experiments with fat mice. Lila, see the little red one there? Yeah. That's called a seed shrimp, I think. A shrimp? Well, they're not really shrimp, but they look like a seed, so they're called a shrimp. They're probably the same family. Anyway, you, you told me that you've been out uh, collecting insects in the pond? Yeah. What happened? Well, we went down to our pond, and we got some nuts, and we, if we saw something, we grabbed at it. Mm -hmm. We put it in little specimen jars, and then we looked it up in a book and mm -hmm. wrote down what it was. What did you find? Well, we found some leeches, and we found a uh, little trout, and we found a whole bunch of water boatmen and mm -hmm. You'll find some shrimp and everything. In fact, there's a water boatman swimming along right there, right? You recognize yeah. him? They're mm -hmm. kind of funny. They look like a little bug with two oars that stick out, and they roll yeah. along. That's why they're called water boatmen. Well, the way I like to do it is to go down to the pond with a, a pail mm -hmm. and dig out some of the bottom, some of the middle, and some of the top, bring it home, and then put it in an aquarium like this. Let it settle for a day or two. Put a light over the top, and now you have the pond at home so that you can look at it at your leisure. Uh, you, there are some tools that you should have, magnifying glass, mm -hmm. so that when you do get an animal close by, you can take a good close look at it. A baster is also important. Why? Well, here. Let's, sit, let's assume I got an animal right there. I push in on the top, like that. A couple bubbles come out, and then I can go just like that. And then you put it into a little glass like that so that you can study them much more closely. I've already collected some. See them going swimming around there? There's a three dragonfly nymphs mm -hmm. or more. Those are the ones with the, the three tails that stick out in the back. Yeah. They, and they breathe. There's, a leech. There's the leech, yes. See, this is beginning to settle. It's all coming down to the bottom. There's a freshwater shrimp. Yes, there's a little shrimp in there. My, fa my favorite are, are, the, are the dragonfly nymphs because uh, they don't look too much like dragonflies under the water, but they have a three-pronged tail, and that's how they breathe. How do they breathe with the tail? Well, they, they wag their tail back and forth as they're moving through the water, and there are little fine veins inside, and that's how they exchange, get the oxygen out of the water. Oh. Then eventually they'll go up to the surface, and their skin will crack open, and out will come a, a dragonfly. They don't look much like dragonflies right now. They're also very interesting because they're, they're great predators. They will sit on a branch, and you can watch them in the magnifying glass, and all of a sudden, an underslung jaw comes out and grabs something and grabs it, takes it in. Yeah. So they're, they're fun because they, they're quite active. Then there's wiggly worms. See that wiggly worm up there? Yeah. That's neat. One of my favorites is a flatworm, which I haven't been able to find yet. And they're interesting because they have two eye spots, and they look sort of like they're cross-eyed. And uh, they've been doing a lot of experiments with them. You could do them too. They cut them in half, and each half grows into a new flatworm. You're kidding? Yeah, you can That'd cut them in several neat. pieces. Yes. So my <clears throat> people go to Africa to see the animals, right? You can see why I call this my uh, underwater safari, yeah. because the animals that you'll find are far more interesting than those you'll find in Africa, because they're so unusual. You get a book from the library as you did, and look them up. And you can have hours and hours of fun with an underwater safari. Is it true that a honeybee dies after it stings you? Not if you're stung by a queen bee like the one with the dot painted on her. Her stinger is smooth like a sword, so she can use it many times. But she stays in the hive most of the time. The bee that stings you is probably a worker and its stinger has barbs at the end, something like a fish hook. The barbs hold the stinger in your skin, and as the bee pulls away, part of its abdomen is ripped out. Before long, the bee is dead.
Billy, this rock, when it broke off the rest of the rocks, looked like this. And after a few thousand years, it looked like this. Do you know what makes rocks rounded like that? You've seen rocks rounded, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. What makes them round? The wind, the weather, mm -hmm. nature. In nature. Well, actually, as a matter of fact, most of the time, it's water that carries sand. And as the water flows by, the little grains of sand wear this away and wear it away and wear it away until all the edges are rounded. Mm. Well, today, I'm going to introduce you to the science of lapidary. Do you know what a lapidary is? No, I don't. Well, he's a specialist, or she is a specialist in working with stones mm -hmm. and gems and so. In fact, what you do is you go out and you find rocks like these. I see they're all sharp. And... Yeah, they have sharp edges and all that sort of stuff. Well, what you're going to do is put them into a uh, little container like this and condense what took nature a couple of thousand years. You're going to do it in a couple of weeks. So take those rough stones and put them in this little container. You add some water, just like in nature. Put in some more. Okay. Now you've got to do something that takes the place of the sand that's in the water. You see that? Grit? Yeah, you see that grit? Look, isn't it beautiful how it shines? Yeah. Well, that's very, very hard material that's going to take off those edges. So put in some of that. Is that it? Okay, that's good enough for now, anyway. Okay. Now we put the top on so it's nice and watertight. Oh, I get it. What? You put that, you put this on that. And then what? And it turns. Yes. You can see why they, that's called a rock tumbler. Hmm because it's going to tumble the rocks over and over. And wh how are they going to get smooth? By this grit. Right, that grit, that's right. That's the first stage. As is soon as I get it on here, I'll show you. OK, here we go. Is this what happens to the rocks in the second stage? Mm-hmm. First of all, let's nice get the first stage started. OK. There we go. Now, what's going on inside there? They're tumbling around in the water, and the grit is taking off the sharp edges. Yes. Okay, then after a while, they begin to look like this. All nice and smooth. Yes, they're all nice and smooth. Then you take the, take the water out after three, four, five days. Yeah. Take the water out, wash it out good to get rid of all of this big grit. Then you put in this grit. It's even finer. Yes. Then you do that for a couple of days, and then wash it all out, and then you put in this grit. It looks like volcanic ash. Yeah, real powdery. Mm. Then finally, you put in, wash it all out again, and put in this real, real powdery stuff. And here's what you finally end up with. Look. Oh, nice shiny rocks. Yeah, aren't they nice and shiny? Then, of course, after you've got them looking like this, you can go to the hobby shop. You buy various kinds of gold-looking things to use them up. For example, here is a special kind of rock that uh, started out looking something like those, but it has this orange and, or yellowish and brown thing. It's called a cat's eye. And they turn out very nice, don't they? Yeah, they are. OK, then what you do is after you've got the, the gold thing, you mount it on it like that, and you have a keychain. It's a very nice keychain. Yeah. Would you like to keep that? Sure. OK. Yeah. Thanks. OK. Now, while it took nature a couple of thousand years to make rocks like this into rocks like this, in just a couple of weeks, with this thing turning in your basement or your, or your garage, you can have rocks that started out looking like that, eventually became looking like that, and finally end up looking like that. A garden spider spins a web to catch its prey. When a grasshopper lands in the web, it gets stuck in the sticky strands and can't escape. Immediately, the spider begins wrapping the grasshopper within a silken shroud. To produce a sheet of silk, it uses most of its spinnerets at the same time. It doesn't stick to its own silk because of oil on its body. By spinning the grasshopper as though around a spit, the spider will have it wrapped and ready to eat or store away in just 40 seconds. You're doing pretty well. Yeah. Look out, there comes it. Oh, oh, oh no. crash. Well, you've played games like this before, haven't you? Yes, I have. Yeah. All right, let's turn it off. Well, okay. 
And I understand you're president of the computer club. Yes. Well, congratulations. Thank you. You've looked inside a computer at some time or other? Yes, I have. Okay, well, let's take a look inside this one. Okay. I have it all ready so that we can take it apart relatively quickly. I will disconnect this and disconnect that. Okay. What are those for? Well, that's to connect the keyboard, you know, to the rest of the thing. Okay. And there's what the keyboard looks like underneath. Okay, now what do you see? A big piece of metal yeah, or aluminum. Yeah, a big piece of aluminum. Any idea what that's for? Not really. Well, when you turn on the computer and you feed the signal over to the television set up there, you're actually a little television station. <laughs> so you're sending out signals that could interfere with other sets. So this is shielding. They put this over the top to keep the signals oh. right here and send them only through the wires up to your television set. Okay, now if we take this off, now you get at the real part of the computer. Oh, yes. This is what you've seen before, I yeah. assume. Yeah. Do you know, recognize what those are? Those are ROM chips and ROM well, chips. Well, this one is the ROM chip, and this, uh, it's not the chip. The chip is actually buried inside here, and all these oh. little, little bumps that you see are the wires that are connected to it to make it go all the other places. And this is the central processing unit of this one. Oh. You see these eight along here? Yes. Well, this is an 8-bit computer. You've heard of that? Yes, I have. Okay. Each one of these sends a, uh, a bite off to the screen, and uh, each little dot has to have a signal from each one of those. What is this? That one, from what I understand, is the color control. You can control the color image on the screen by juggling that. Oh, and yes. here's what happens, you see, when you put in the joystick. Yeah, the current goes through all these, these little things and goes all over the place. And here's where the cartridge goes in over here. It comes down to yeah, these. It goes down to those. Anyway, that's a look inside. It's very complicated. Yes. And I certainly have a great deal of respect for the engineers who design that kind of thing. <laughs> Let's put the shielding back on. Okay. And then we'll put the cover on. Because not all of the computer is so complicated. But first you have to help me get to connect these okay. parts. Can you get that one? Yeah. Okay, next. Okay. Okay, good. Now, you were working that joystick before. Yes, I was. Yeah, and I'll bet you haven't taken a joystick apart. No, I no, haven't. Ordinarily, you don't do that. Well, let's take a look at this one. I had you hold it on the top because I've already got all the screws out. First of all, look what's underneath. A little plate or something. A little plate. You see that plastic wheel? Yes. Put, move the joystick. Oh, it presses down on something on yes. the plate. Yes. See, there are four little bumps there, yeah. and that presses on it. Now, on let's, these little silver? Right. Well, here, let's take a look at it. We can pull it up like this. Let's assume the current is coming in down here. See how it follows on those copper things? Yes. Then trace that one. When it gets right to there, it stops. Why? Because there's a, that's a switch. Oh, so if you press, press it in. On, press it in on it. That right complete, and that's what that little plastic wheel does. Oh, neat. So now you can press this one and this one at the same time, it or any diagonally. one of them. And here's the one that was the, sort of the start button. Okay. All right, this time you're going to play the game, but you can't use the joystick. You have to use the switches. Oh, no. Okay. Take it. Go ahead and hang on. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Um, yeah. Let's see how you do. Up. Push the top one. That's the idea. Now to the right. Yeah. It's very it's good. a lot harder with yeah. just using the A lot the harder? Yeah. Sure, because the joystick is... Wow, what's going on? I just ate a ghost. You get a ghost, I see. Even even without the joystick. Yeah. I'm dead, though. Anyway, so it's not nearly as complicated, and you don't really have to understand anything that goes on in the computer to have fun with it and actually do some very amazing things. But this was one I thought you would get a kick out of because it's so simple. That's neat. You're hiking in the woods, and suddenly... There up ahead, you see a mound rising up from the flat countryside. You recognize it immediately as one of the more than 100,000 Indian mounds found throughout the Mississippi Valley and the Great Lakes areas. No one knew for sure who the mound builders were until archaeologists went inside. They found rooms that were obviously burial chambers. For whom? Skilled traders, for one thing. They found grizzly bear teeth from the Rockies, conch shells from Florida, hammered copper from Lake Superior, obsidian from Yellowstone, and mica from the southern Appalachian Mountains. And the builders of the mounds produced many fine works of art. 
the archaeologists concluded that the so-called mound builders were many different Indian tribes who lived in the area as far back as 1,000 years before Christ to as late as the 1700s. All we know about these early Americans comes from the evidence buried in their mounds. I don't assume you've ever boiled water with an ice cube, have you? No. Mm -mm. You don't. You don't look like you think it can be done. No, I don't think it can be done at well, all. Well, okay, you and I are going to do that. First of all, let's examine what's happened when something boils. What's okay. the temperature of water when it boils? 100 degrees Celsius. Yes, but most people ignore the other very important part of that uh, that definition, sort of, and that is they have to add abnormal atmospheric pressure. Oh. Yeah. Well, think of it this way. There's air molecules bouncing around on top of the water, right? Yeah. Okay, so in order to get 100 degrees Celsius, the air pressure has to be normal because if it were greater than that, it would take more effort to bunch, pound the molecules oh, up, right? I understand, okay. yeah. And if you took away some of the pressure, it would boil at a lower temperature. Mm -hmm. You've heard about yeah. people uh, have to cook at the top of a mountain. What happened? Well, the, um, the air is thinner, so the pressure is lower. Yes, and it takes longer to cook. Yeah. Because the water doesn't boil at 100 degrees. It's lower than that. Oh. So all we have to do is somehow get some of the pressure away from the top of that water, and we should be able to boil it. So here's what we'll do. We'll put the stopper in here like this. Now there's normal atmospheric pressure on the top. When we take it away, we'll let it come out just a little bit. Now we'll push it in nice and tight. So we're, now that's completely filled with steam. Mm -hmm. When the water, when the heat is away, what's going to happen to the steam now as it cools off? Well, it's, it's going to just... Condense back into water. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. If we can now lower the pressure even more, there's an ice cube. Would you mm -hmm. take it in the togs and rub it over the top of that flask? Okay. Keep it, what you're trying to do is cool off the... the um, Vapor on top. Keep going. There See what's some happening, bubbles Avalon? coming up. Yeah. Now, why is that happening? Because Over the top. Because um, the ice cube is cooling. cooling the steam. It, the steam inside. Back to water, and we're lowering the pressure. Yeah. yeah. Now we wouldn't want to go on and do this too long. Okay. Because what would happen if we kept rubbing the ice over there all the time? and the pressure would get lower and lower and lower and lower. Well, the flask would explode. Oh, no, no. The correct term is implode. Oh, the opposite of explode. Yes, and that's why I would do it in a round flask, because it's stronger than a regular kind of flask. So I think I'll take the okay. stopper out before the pressure gets too low. Okay, so now, who are you gonna tell that you boiled water with an ice cube? Well, I'm gonna show my friend Melinda. Yeah, think she'll believe you? Yeah, I, I hope so. And you can explain it? Yeah. By lowering the pressure? Mm-hmm. Good. <laughs> 